riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always, Thou art the only first in my heart. Great God of heaven, my treasure Thou art. In Thee, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In thy righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline thy ear to me and save me. Be thou to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. The hymn is God of the Sparrow, number 272. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray first together and then in silence. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. We have failed to model your compassion toward us in our compassion toward others, which provides healing and hope. For we have forgotten that it is in giving that we receive. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your life and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. 
I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. It is our privilege at this time to participate in the sacrament of baptism as Dr. and Mrs. Alan Ayers and Alan Sharon present two of their children for the sacrament of baptism, uh, Rebecca Rogers and Laura Ellen. The elder uh, representative is Susan Hammer and also standing uh, with their younger sisters are Mary Catherine and Jonathan. This is a very special occasion because on Thursday, uh, Alan and Sharon and family leave for Lyon, France, where they will be stationed for three years. Uh, Alan's a doctorate, is a PhD, and he works for a French-owned company, and uh, they will be there. They will be members of the church, and we will be in contact with them. If you want to get to France, they have this big, big place where you can come visit. <laughs> In fact, he says somewhere on the premises of this chateau where they will be staying is a wine cellar that could accommodate about 100. So uh, that gives you an idea of uh, the quarters which they will be uh, living in. Uh, they do speak French. Uh, Sharon is a French teacher, and uh, they will do quite well in the school system. Is my mic not on? I have it on, but uh, it's not coming through. So I may, well, this mic is gone too, so uh, we'll try to make the best we can. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always to the close of the age. Alan Sharon, know that the promises of God are for you and for your children. By baptism, God puts his sign on you and your children to show that all of you belong to him and gives you Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you and your children will also share in his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you and they will be raised with him to new life. Friends, in presenting your children for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want your children to study him, to know him, to love him, and to serve him as his chosen disciple. Show your purpose by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him? Do you intend your children to be his disciples, to obey his word, and to show his love? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell these new disciples, Laura Ellen Ayers and Rebecca Rogers Ayers, the good news of the gospel? to help them know all that Christ commands and by your fellowship to strengthen their family ties with the household of God. The congregation will respond by saying, we do. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your faithfulness, promise in this sacrament, and for the hope we have in your Son, Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit, so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. O oh God, who calls us from death to life, we give ourselves to you and with the church through all ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
full name of the child? Rebecca Rogers Ames. Okay. Rebecca Rogers Ayers, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you, both now and forevermore. Amen. like taking a shower. What is the full name of the child? Laura Ellen Ayers. Okay. Laura Ellen Ayers, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you, both now and forevermore. Amen. We as members of the congregation have witnessed these baptisms. We become extensions of the family for Rebecca and for Laura. We remember our own commitment to Jesus Christ, and by our faithfulness to Christ, we provide an environment within the body of Christ, both in this country and in France and wherever the body of Christ may be, so that others, as they claim Christ and offer their children, may know that the power of God is with each one. But we do become agents of God's grace for our children and for adults who claim Christ and who will know of God's love and salvation. Present uh, Rebecca. You want to go for a walk? Okay. You want to hold my hand? All right. What about holding the hand of, of Mary Catherine? Let's do that. We'll have a parade. In the Acts of the Apostles, Peter, as he preached, says, Repent and be baptized, for the promise is to you and to your children and all who are far off. And so in the Reformed Presbyterian family, we baptize children, symbolizing that it is in our weakness that God's grace comes to us, the power of God comes to us to give us salvation. It is not something we earn or merit. It comes to us as gift. And so we celebrate the, birth, the baptism today of Rebecca and Laura, and we celebrate their reception officially into the body of Christ, and we become extensions of God's grace, that though we'll be separated from them by many thousands of miles, they are part of the body of Christ. And as they worship with members of the Reformed Church in France, we will be one with them. They will have others who become grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles, so that these two and Mary Catherine and Jonathan will know of God's grace as they come to the place of accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, fulfilling the vows taken here this Sunday. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ we thank you for choosing to add to our number brothers and sisters in faith. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together our baptismal response which is printed in the worship bulletin. Again, welcome to Worship at First Presbyterian. I invite you now to reach for the friendship pads located on the center aisle. As we sign, we reflect the oneness of the body of Christ as we gather for worship on this beautiful uh, summer Sunday, the last Sunday of July. 
If you are here as a guest or visitor, uh, you will notice in the pew rack in front of you there is a card with a red ribbon on it. It would be certainly helpful to us if you would put it on, particularly for our members sitting in front of you or behind you who do not have the benefit of the friendship pad. We, we do want this Sunday to extend to you a warm welcome and, and acknowledge your presence with us for worship. A special welcome as well to those of you who worship with us by way of television. We are First Presbyterian Church of Raleigh, North Carolina. We're located across from the state capitol at the corner of West Market and Salisbury Streets. And we're thankful for your participation in worship with us this Sunday morning. We're thankful for your prayers and for your financial contributions which make this outreach ministry possible here at First Church. If you are here as a guest or visitor, and you're looking for a church home, we invite you to join with us in Christian discipleship. This is a very vital, strong congregation. We've been at this site since 1816 and will be so for many, many years to come. But our most precious asset are people who are willing to make the sacrifice of distance to be part of this downtown congregation, coming in from the suburbs and from all over Wake County and beyond, because we have people who come in from Johnston County and from Franklin County and from Durham County. We come from all over to be part of this exciting and vital downtown congregation. There is a place to check on the friendship pad, your interest in receiving information in the mail or perhaps in receiving a visit. If you would like to speak with someone directly this Sunday, there is an officer in this room to my right who is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member by transfer of letter, by reaffirmation of faith, or by profession of faith and perhaps baptism. There is also the procedure of affiliate membership, which is helpful for individuals who are students or who are in business, who are in the area for a short period of time. You identify with us as, as your church home away from home, but you do not transfer your membership. So we welcome you to join with us in Christian discipleship from this downtown site, which has been here since 1816. Following the worship, there is fellowship and coffee in the Balkan Parlor, which is the room uh, off to the sanctuary as you would eg enter and exit. And the uh, pastors and director of Christian education, after we greeted the doors, will go to that room and we look forward to meeting you at the close of the service. It is good for us to be in worship on this Sunday. And we're thankful to God that we are here.
That was beautiful. Thank you all. I'd like to invite any other children who are here this morning to come down if they'd like to come hear the children's sermon as well. I believe this is a record. <laughs> I'll come down here. Whoops. Excuse me. I don't want to step on anybody. Our hymn is hymn 426, Lord speak to me that I may speak, and we shall sing the first and the last stanzas of the hymn, Lord speak to me that I may speak.
Hear the word of God as it comes to us from Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none that does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of humanity to see if there are any that act wisely, that seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike corrupt. There is none that does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, Israel shall be glad. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Hear now God's word to us. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. We continue our lectionary passage for, our, for this Sunday from the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, reading verses 1 through 21. As we consider for our topic this Sunday, 1,500 plus in God's hands. And if we keep on having this many more children, we could probably add a few hundred to that because we had lots of energy and excitement this past week with the cast of teachers and volunteers and musicians and young people and children in vocational Bible school. Let us give our attention now to the reading of God's word. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. And Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, 
This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough, and a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The word of the Lord. Thanks be unto our God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's in the late 1960s, and on a ranch at about 11.30, a five-year-old Johnny John wakes up. The parents determine that he has appendicitis, but the closest hospital is 80 miles away, so they call by telephone. And a doctor from that area can come by plane, but it's night. Where can the plane land? And the father has an idea. 35 to 40 minutes later, as they hear the drone of the plane, the doctor says, looking down, it is an amazing sight to behold. There is one light, then another light, then another light, then another light, then another light. 50 vehicles in all, from pickup trucks to Cadillacs, some driven by both husband and wife, line the field, each sharing a light to confirm a life. The plane lands and takes off with the child to the hospital. Well, in our gospel lesson, we read of what happens when a gift is shared. Amazing things happen when people like you and I can be moved to allow God's power to work through us. And so as we consider this topic this morning, 1,500 plus in the hands of God, we look at it from two, two foci, or two points. When we give what we have to God, God multiplies the gift. And we are called upon in the second place to meet the test of commitment, but not being limited by perception of reality. John's account is an amazing one, the feeding of the 5,000. But if you look at the Gospels, you are aware that this account is radically different from the accounts found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's point is theological as well as giving an understanding of Jesus ministering to need. There are a lot of variations. This is the only Gospel which mentions that the Sea of Galilee is also the, 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 the Lake Tiberias. It also is the only Gospel where Andrew and Philip and the lad is mentioned. Also in this gospel, the number of bread is different. Also in this gospel, there is the point made, if you notice it, about the sign. John, in his gospel, makes the theological point all the way through that there are seven signs which lead up to the ultimate sign, the resurrection. And this is one of them. But this lad has five barley loaves and two fish, and Andrew brings him to Jesus, and he too is skeptical. What is, what is this among so many? And we read in the gospel that Jesus gives the prayer of thanksgiving. And the Greek word to give thanks is Eucharistin, the word for the Eucharist. It is what happens when we give of ourselves and the power of God works through us as human beings and faith is multiplied to do what others may think is impossible. And that's really what is behind John's gospel, you see. For as we read the gospel and compare it, what John is about here is to claim that the Logos, if you start back at chapter 1, the Logos who created the world through whom the world came into being through Jesus, this Logos, this power becomes flesh. John is about demonstrating that the Logos of God is never limited by perception of reality. 
a perception of reality that this can be done or that can be done, the Logos shatters all limitations. And so the question is addressed to you and me as it was to the disciples who had just so little to offer. And the question is, are we bound to perceptions of reality which enslave us, which limited us? Are we bound to that? And the gospel, as John presents it, says, no, we are not. The Logos can take what we offer and multiply it and transform it, and we are transformed in the process. The Logos of God is never limited by reality, spiritual or mental or physical. Amazing things happen when we give what we have, our lives, our time, our talents, our possessions. They are multiplied. The power of God is not limited by our perceptions of reality. This is why in the epistle lesson, which is a doxology, Paul reminds us that if we're caught up in the knowledge of the love of God as, as the saints participating in the saints, that this knowledge of the love of God reminds us of the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of God, which is beyond anything we can perceive as real. So in this passage, John demonstrates the power of God to take what is here and work beyond human perceptions of reality. But in the second place, John's amazing account tells us that to share ourselves with God is to meet the test of commitment. For you see, this is where John differs from the other Gospels. As we read this, we read that Jesus asked the question of Philip, knowing what he's going to do, and he does it to test Philip, because Philip is bound in terms of perceptions of reality. Philip is going to be tested. And the point that John makes in his gospel is that, yes, Jesus is concerned with hungry people, but more importantly, Jesus is concerned about the spiritual power which can minister not only to physical need, but to spiritual need. Jesus is concerned with his disciples and you and me meeting the test of commitment that we're not limited by reality, spiritual or mental or physical. That is a point here which John and Jesus is making through John's gospel. And so he asked Philip, knowing what he is going to do. And Philip says, six months' wages couldn't do this. Lord, he's, he, he, he's looking at things through the eyes of a banker or a businessman or someone who keeps the household budget. Got 15 folks coming over for, for, for supper, and you, and, and you don't have enough to feed them. And even Andrew, who brings the lad with five barley loaves and two fish, can only comment, it's not enough, Lord. They are bound, but they are going to be tested to show that the power of this Logos at work through Jesus can shatter limitations. Realism and cautious calculations of what we can do or cannot do are thrown into a hat. Limitations are shattered. And so the, the disciples are tested to enable them to grow past their perceptions of reality. Anything is possible with this God who has come as Messiah, but they've got to trust in enough in it to give of themselves. Well, football season is about here. It's not that it's quarter to 12, it's about here, but it's about here in terms of weeks. The pros have started to practice, and college football cannot be far behind. We learn through testing to move past limitations. Whether you're taking music lessons or ballet, we learn. Practice is one thing, but doing it is another. You go to med school or to law school or to graduate school, or you go to college or you're a mentor in, in business, it's, long, it's all right as long as you're working with someone, but when you got to do it yourself, you're tested. And you've got to work beyond what you perceive as your limitations in order to make it. Well, that was the case for me as a freshman. Someone got sick, and I got to be on the third team of our trip to play my first college game against Washington and Lee University in Lexington. It was the first time for me to fly. 
The coach was an insurance executive who would take Tom out four months out of the year. He let his subordinates run the firm, and he would coach the team. And our backfield coach was professor of political science, Dr. Ross Pritchett, an All-American from Arkansas who played for the Washington Redskins. And the line coach was also someone in business who took time off. He played for Vanderbilt. But the head coach, Rick Mays, also believed in insurance actuary tables. And so he didn't want the entire team and coaches and trainers, everybody to be wiped out with a plane disaster. So what did he do? We flew in two Southern Airway planes, half the line, half the backfield, half the coaches, half the trainers in one plane and everybody in the rest, the other plane. It was a wonderful experience, but also an eerie one because you would really meet the test if one half didn't make it and you had to play the game without them. But the game film on Monday, even though this was uh, small college football, we took game films and on Monday it was shown that Stock had done right on one play and had goofed up on another, but I was tested. On one play, I'd, I'd tackle a halfback behind the line. I was a defensive tackle. But on another play, I was fooled. I penetrated. And on a cross block, I was wiped out. And the halfback went for eight yards. And believe me, the coach pointed that out. He kept on running it back and back and back <laughs> till I could dream about it the next night. But you learn by being tested. Philip and the disciples were being tested that they could move past any perceptions which they had of themselves spiritually or mentally or physically in their discipleship and their following Jesus. They were going to have to learn something. And they did. They did. We're not bound by cautious calculations of what is possible or not possible if we are followers of Jesus Christ. It is said, as we read, that they took up 12 baskets of food, the result of breaking up five barley loaves. And everyone had enough to eat. Well, the people were so amazed at this sign. You remember that word sign? This is a key word for John, that they wanted Jesus perceived to make him king. They wanted to limit Jesus by our human perceptions of reality. They needed a political king, and he could perform wonders, and he was God's man. They, they reversed the first question to the catechism. What is man's chief end is to glorify God. They believed that God's purpose was to glorify them. Here was God's representative, and boy, could he be used as their king. They wanted to limit Jesus by the calculations of reality for them. And Jesus would have no part of it. No part of it. He goes off to pray, and his disciples get into a boat to head back across the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias, to Capernaum. In a way, they hit a headwind. They are having a hard time rowing. And to demonstrate that the Logos of God comes and shatters all limitations, Jesus comes to them over the water and gets into the boat. They're terrified. But he reminds them, do not be afraid. For as his disciples, after he is gone, they will face the impossible. And we called upon as his disciples to face reality and to move beyond anything they ever calculated they could ever do by the power of God. You know, we worship in a boat. This is another word for the sanctuary. It's the nave. When we leave and go out into the world, we're still the nave because we're the body of Christ and God is with us. And when the storms hit, we have to realize that the power of God is with us to move us beyond any limitations, spiritually or physically. That could be another whole sermon. What about you and me? As we hear this gospel lesson, as we consider doing things in the midst of society and church which seem impossible to do, how can we move beyond the cautious calculations when we have figured out we can do this, we can't do that? Well, a children vacation Bible school could have been intimidated by the fact that thousands of children go through Wake Med every year. What could so few do to offset the enormity of the number of people who go through Wake Med, many of whom are indigent, who receive help there? What did they do? What did they do this week? They had a mission project. They made 150 packets to take to Wake Med, a plastic bag which had a story in it, plus the tape of the story. 150 were brought. Five barley loaves and two fish from each of the kids is amazing. 150 units, plus other things were taken. And the kids 
were enthusiastic about what they were able to do with what they were able to offer to God. In their own way, not intimidated. Yes, you know, thousands and thousands come through every year, but they were going to make an impact this week, doing what they could do this week. Well, how do we minister in society as a church and as Christians when we are faced with insurmountable problems in terms of the ethics of our faith as it hits life? We're reminded in the, in the Psalter lesson that we are to act as ethical and moral creatures, as agents of God, because when a poor person or a needy person is treated unjustly, then God is offended. These are individuals, the psalmist says, who eat others like people eat bread. They, they devour people and their corruptedness. And we as Christians are not to stand and to allow this to happen if we believe that God calls us to put our Christian faith into practice. We 1,500 plus of us here at First Presbyterian Church in terms of what we do with business in the politics, economic arenas of life here in Raleigh, in the state, in the world. And this was brought home at Presbytery meeting. We heard a lady from Northern Ireland, a Presbyterian by the name of Helen Kennedy. Her brother had been killed. He was a university graduate, worked for the penal institution system, but working for reform. And he had the misfortune of having his picture printed in the paper. And he was targeted and he was assassinated. He had just left breakfast with his wife and children. If you want to see a movie about all that, to see The Devil's Own, Harrison Ford and Brad Pitt, about what happens when people get sucked into an eye for an eye, that things are impossible, that it's impossible to reverse. Well, this lady was in church one Sunday, comfortable, singing in the choir, her husband, an engineer out there in the congregation, and a visiting clergyman came and said, you know, as of the time we're speaking, there are people fanning out in Europe and the United States raising money for weapons of destruction to bring back to our shores so that we can kill each other. What a difference it would make if we Christians believe the gospel and we're willing to make a difference to allow the power of Christ to transform human lives. What a difference it would make. And she was moved, and her husband was moved, and they became part of the five barley loaves and two fish. And she heads up a children's center where both Protestants and Catholics can unlearn decades of hatred, an eye for an eye, a life for a life. If we really believe that our gifts are multiplied, if we really believe that life before us provides us an opportunity to be tested, to make a difference, this gospel points it out in spades. What about us here at First Presbyterian Church with one of the greatest spiritual challenges we have before us, which is our capital funds campaign for $6.3 million? If we were going to look at this from a human standpoint, you would say it is not possible. There are well, good intentioned members who say we have a hard time raising 1.2 million for our annual budget. This is not possible. But our gospel lesson says we are not to be limited by what we perceive as reality if we believe the gospel. For you see, every gift is important. When those people showed up that night with their pickup trucks and whatever they were driving, the pickup truck and the light from a pickup truck was just as important as the light of a Cadillac. So big gifts and small gifts all provide light, an avenue whereby we as a congregation can minister from this site well into the 21st century. This gospel says what we're about is not a fool's mission. Yes, we could adopt the, the attitude of a Philip and an Andrew. Gee, we don't have enough resources to do that, Lord. But the gospel lesson says no to that. No to that. We are 1,500 plus in the hands of God, and amazing things can happen if we meet the test of commitment to allow ourselves to be pushed beyond more than we thought we could ever do in the name and the cause of Christ, and in the process we are transformed as we do it. We had a gift. I don't usually know what people give, and I'm, it's getting close, gang, but uh, we're gonna, I'm going to finish this sermon. I don't usually do this, but we're going to finish this sermon. 
Letty gave $5,000. Uh, she is in her mid-80s, lives very modestly, children are grown, grandchildren are grown, and her grandchildren have children, so she's a great-grandmother. No one here who's ever going to benefit but what's accomplished. But this lady made a sacrificial gift, 10 times what she normally gives to the church in a given year, a $500 pledge. Because she believes what we just enacted in this sacrament of baptism, that all of us are extensions of a family for children. And she wants the children to have the best quality facilities for education and fellowship and recreation. And I'm sure she's for the outreach as well. She's willing to do so that individuals in the future can be equipped when she's in the church triumphant. Because this gift will live on. Yes, we've received gifts of 500,000, 200,000, 100,000, 50, 40, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, on down. But you know, it's not the size of the gift because everyone who is given, it's the five barley loaves and two fish in terms of the capability of that individual or family. But what is needed is all of us doing it. The good news is that we are 40% there, but only a third of us who normally contribute to the annual budget have made a pledge. If the other two thirds participate, we will exceed and demonstrate that the power of the Logos working in a human heart and mind can accomplish much more than we ever thought possible because God is not limited by human perceptions of reality. We're tested to live our faith in this church and in society. To give our gift is to have it multiplied. And we are 1,500 in the hands of God. And indeed, little children shall lead them. And we will lead this week with children attempting to do the impossible with thousands upon thousands upon thousands at Wake Med, but bringing in 150 units so that a difference could be made in one week's ministry. Let it be so for each one of us, as our gifts are multiplied, and as we meet the test of commitment. Amen. Let us stand and affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are found on page 14 in the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Great and loving God, we offer to you this day praise and thanksgiving, for we know that we are truly blessed. We rejoice in all your gifts of love to us, especially thanking you for the joy of children singing and playing and laughing for the dedication of teachers and parents and caregivers, for the relaxing days of summer and fun-filled vacations, for the penetrating warmth of sunshine and the refreshing wetness of rain. Holy God, we see evidence of your creative acts of goodness and your generosity in the world about us and in your people. 
Yet in our world of plenty and abundance, there are many who are lacking and in need of the basic necessities of life. We pray for those who go to bed hungry without bread or food to eat. We pray for those who have no place to sleep or lay their head at night. We pray for those who feel unloved, forgotten, or unwanted. We pray for those whose lives are filled with stress, anxiety, and fear. Loving God, we ask that you will be with all those who have special needs this day, the sick or hospitalized, those who face medical treatments or anxiously await test results, those who grieve the loss of loved ones, and those experiencing the pain of broken relationships. We ask also that you bless those members of our congregation in Korea in these last days of their visit, strengthening the bonds of unity and fellowship with our Christian brothers and sisters and the Sunan Presbyterian Church there. Be with our delegation as they travel and bring them home safely to us. Caring God, you know the silent prayers in all our hearts and the special needs we bring to you. Transform our lives through your power, bringing peace, healing, hope, and forgiveness. Bless us now that we may pass that blessing on to others, multiplying your gifts and sharing your love. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and what is ours to give as we receive our morning offering.
Let us pray. Holy God, as Jesus fed the multitude with a handful of loaves and fish, take the gifts that we bring this day, the little that we bring, bless it and multiply it and turn it into an abundance to help meet the needs of your people. In your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number, can't see it. <laughs> okay, um, 442, The Church is One Foundation. As we leave as those who claim Jesus Christ, may we go with the power of God, the Logos, in us through the risen Lord. May we uh, be aware that as we live our faith, we are not those limited by reality because we claim the power of Christ in us. And now the grace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen. Yeah.